Every tough tip is got uh, we've just got gave a uh, TED talk on why PowerPoints are evil. Um, my wife is a graphic designer and she said it is. So the idea is supposed to be that you don't have any text or bullet points, you're gonna try it for the first time. There will be text on the last slide that's just a list of questions which I don't know the answers to. So forgive me on that. Um, so what I'm really wanting to look at today is the issue of uh, the role of social class in uh, non-cognitive factors uh, and subsequently its effect on uh, things like educational attainment, occupational attainment and so on and so forth. Um, why might this be important? Isn't the heyday of social class and all of that being gone? Uh, there's not too many masters around or whatever, but uh, it does seem to be that sociologists are still quite interested in social class and uh, you know with the interesting books like Couple of the 21st Century, uh, the issue of uh, income inequality has really come to the fore. Uh, this is a, a relatively famous graph now by a guy called um, uh, Sean Regan from Stanford where he shows basically the gap between the 90th and 10th percentile on income in uh, education uh, performance on standardised tests uh, has risen uh, and is now surpassing the gap between uh, black-white differences in standardised tests in the US. So uh, the thing that's quite interesting when we look at some other issues uh, in relation to inequality uh, you know, gender gaps, if you look at the PISA statistics over time, uh, gender gaps have really de declined quite dramatically. Um, we're also seeing a lot of um, uh, differences in black-white differences declining quite rapidly. Um, but social class uh, gaps have essentially been uh, not only resistant to change, but also uh, starting to grow. And so the question has come up is how do we, how do we explain this? Uh, and there was for a lot of time a real focus on cognitive. So how can we fix uh, the gap in uh, you know, schooling performances and those sorts of things. Uh, and then a guy called James Hackman came along and basically said, look, if you do anything in relation to cognitive changes, it doesn't have much of a payoff once kids are past the age of 8 or 10. We need to start focusing attention on to non-cognitive factors. And um, this is just, this, uh, this issue of um, non-cognitive factors have just exploded. You know, everybody from sociologists to economists to psychologists are, are talking about non-cognitive factors uh, in, in closing um, attainment gaps, uh, so university entry, uh, entrance into professional jobs. Um, but what I think it's really exposed is, is that uh, different groups of researchers Sociologists, psychologists, funds have very different ways of thinking about how these differences in non cognitive factors might emerge. And there really is two major ones. Uh, and I want to suggest that uh, maybe there's another way to think about it at the end. And so the first way to think about it is cultural models. And cultural models are no Star Trek things. Um, this is going to be a really boring talk. Um, uh, cultural models essentially suggest that social class has a specific set of uh, factors related to identity. And so um, people that run these uh, sorts of models talk about the idea of social gravity. And so uh, you, you would expect, for example, under this model, that working class people have a particular set of identity issues and that this exerts a, a gravitational type pull of kids that are within that sphere and that uh, this makes them have a particular beliefs in relation to self-concepts, self-beliefs, values, those sorts of things. So it's, it's really drawing people towards uh, similar peers within the same group. I mean, so much so that uh, some of these models talk about there, there really being a very strong cost to acting outside of your dominant group. So being a working class uh, child under this framework who wants to go and uh, uh, do political science at university 
there's a cost that needs to be overcome in acting in a non-social class appropriate manner. The alternative perspective to this is the rational action theory. So keeping the, the stuff and stuff going. <laughs> this is basically a test to find out who the nerds are, and Chris is winning. So. <laughs> the rational action uh, theory approach suggests that social class emerges from rational decisions that people make based on uh, cost-benefit analysis and trade-offs between different situational affordances and constraints that exist within different classes. So under this framework, you know, everybody values education, everybody wants to get a good education, everybody wants to get as far um, as possible up the social ladder, but there are different situational affordances and constraints, and there are different uh, trade-offs then between making decisions at educational transition points. And under this theory, um, Goldthorpe and Marine are the, the head people in this area. They talk about there really being three things that differentiate working class kids from uh, kids that come from a professional backgrounds, so parents with professional degrees. Uh, the first is differences in achievement. So just like James Hackman, there are standardised differences in standardised tests from the age of four between working class and professional class kids. Those differences are, are there before the start of school, they remain consistent uh, throughout school. So that's one. Two is there's obviously differences in resources. <laughs> but in this case, these are quite uh, concrete resources rather than what uh, Paul and Jan uh, James and I were talking about, uh, abstract resources that serve as a catch-all theoretical uh, crutch. Uh, in this case, we're talking about economic resources, we're talking about social capital, these kind of issues. The third thing they talk about is uh, what's called relative risk aversion. And under this framework, there are two things that people strive for. The first is status and maintenance. Status and maintenance is, I'm going to pursue education as far as I possibly can, such that I can get into the same social class position as my parents. The other one is status maximisation, which is, I'm going to continue on to education to get as high in the social hierarchy as I can. Now, according to Goldthorpe, these things can be in contrast, such that for working class children, at the end of school, they might decide that there is too much risk in going to university in the a sense that they may drop out of university and therefore not do an apprenticeship and not get into the same social class as their parents, go to an underclass rather than a working class, and so that going to university is risky. And given that status maintenance is preference to status maximisation, often working class kids will make the rational choice to avoid university and go into an apprenticeship. And uh, this is a sort of trade-off that kids from uh, university educated parent backgrounds don't have to make because if they want status maximisation or status maintenance, they have to go to university, there's no choice. So this is the idea behind rational action theory. Um, have an issue with both of those, and really the issue is uh, that when we look at schooling, uh, we need to think not just about standardised test scores, but about relative rank order. And so here you see the rock looking huge and buff, like when I, uh, well, Never like that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the rock here, which is what I constantly feel like when I stand anywhere near Herb or Joseph. <laughs> so, you know, relative rank order matters. So, how does this all come together? Well, uh, I want to propose what I call an information distortion model <coughs> of social class differences in non cognitive factors. We're going to start with non cognitive factors to do with self beliefs and values and move on to what this might say about attainment gaps in terms of university entry and graduation. Um, I'm going to be talking about self-concept and I'm going to be talking about task value, in particular intrinsic value and utility value. The top equation here is stolen from the Brandon Gold Thought Paper. Essentially what it means is this. An individual's self-concept, phi, is a function of their academic achievement on standardised tests. Simple. 
So under the breeding goal thought model, people will go on to higher education if they have strong self-concepts and their self-concepts are purely a product of their achievement. So once you condition on achievement, there will be no differences by social class and self-concept. Uh, I want to make an alteration to that. I want to say that the AI, standardised achievement test, that's wrong. What we should be viewing that is relative rank order within the school. And relative rank order we can see is a product of underlying academic achievement on standardised scores with a correction factor. And the correction factor is pi, which I'm going to call the probability of being overmatched or undermatched, We'll explain that in a minute, and the degree of stratification that exists within an educational system. So you can kind of see where this is going, right? I mean, essentially, this is the big fish of the pond effect, but it's in combination with sociologist obsession with the way in which we structure our educational systems. So we'll go through what this might look like with a really dorky um, uh, animation that I wasted a day trying to make <laughs> um, Okay, so let's go through what pi is. So basically what I said pi is, is the degree to which a child is overmatched or undermatched. What do I mean by that? Okay, so undermatched is the probability that a child will have a rank order position within their school that is greater than their rank order within the country. Alright, we'll, we'll go to what that looks like in a little bit. Uh, Overmatching is when people are in a have a relative rank order in the school that is less than their rank order, percentile rank, within the country. So again, starting to sound like big fish little pond. Basically, it's the idea that you can be at the bottom of your class at Scots College or um, um, and you can be the bottom of the class, but still be quite high within the rank order of the country. Alternatively, you can be like uh, when I grew up in a, a class of six people and be far and away the top of the five fellow students that I had. But when it comes to the ATAR marks, not doing so well. <laughs> so, how does this all come about in relation to social class differences? So remember, the breeding goal thought model is that once you control for achievement, there are no differences in self-concept and self groups The assimilation model is that uh, social class plays a role, but that working class children will have lower self-concepts than would be expected, and kids in professional backgrounds will have higher because they will assimilate towards their peers. I'm going to make the complete opposite claim, and that is that kids from working class backgrounds tend to be enrolled in schools which are lower on average achievement than their well-off peers, and well-off peers tend to be enrolled in Scots College, such that they tend to be enrolled in, uh, in uh, schools with higher average ability. So let's work through with my Docuville animation what this might look like in different types of schools. So, I'm going to talk about just two school types, but when we look at the results, there's going to be three. The first is, and I'm going to really simplify this, we're going to have a, a particular country, and this country's going to have two schools, right? We're going to have a group of students who get a one if they're smart, and a zero otherwise. And we're going to try and decide how do we sort them into different schools. In a stratified system, what we'd say is, all the kids with high ability go to school A. All the kids with low ability go to school B. Right? Now if we think through the model here, what's going on? Well, you're going to get a situation where your position within the school is vastly different from your position within the country as a whole. If we link that with the tendency for working class kids to be enrolled in schools with lower average ability, you can start to see how might be generated a, fact, a case where working class kids condition on achievement will have higher self-concept and task value than would be expected on the basis of their achievement alone. Alternatively, if we look at 
and top, alternatively, we can have an open system, Finland, uh, I was going to say Sweden, but it's definitely not the case anymore, Finland's probably really one of the only examples anyway, where kids are almost randomly assigned to schools. Not really the case, but for argument's sake, let's say that's the case. Now, if we randomly assign kids to a school, their relative position within the class will be approximately equal to their relative position within the country. And what that means is the mu symbol there, which stands for the degree to which their stratification within a school system will be zero, and therefore their uh, relative achievement will be equal to their achievement on standardised tests, and on that basis, conditioned on achievement, there should be no social class differences in self-concept or task values. So what are the claims that I'm making? Essentially, the claims that I'm making are um, rank order matter, matters. That rank order matters for the development of self-concept and task values. That in a country in which A, there's lots of stratification, and B, there is a systematic tendency for working class and professional class kids to enrol in different types of schools, that in those countries, working class kids will, conditioned on achievement, have higher self-concept, higher task value. Alternatively, in countries which don't stratify at all, the second part of this equation will, will turn to zero, and conditional achievement, there will be no social class differences. So, I'll get rid of my dog animation. And go to, that's the basis of uh, the theory. So go to, what does this mean for our big ultimate question? And the ultimate question is, what do these non-cognitive factors mean for gaps in educational attainment, university entry, university graduation, uh, admission to professional classes in society, what does this all mean? I mean, from this kind of hypothesis, uh, the tracking systems in Germanic countries or the um, stratified systems like Australia or US does start sound pretty good, right? I mean, because essentially the stratification leads to higher self-concept, higher self-concept leads to um, these kind of attainment issues. So the benefit that working class kids are getting should give them a boost. So, under this basis, stratified um, countries, you would say, should have lower attainment gaps. Ah. But, if we come back to rational action theory, remember I said there were three things, self-beliefs, resources, and relative risk conversion. And what I'm going to claim is it's these last two, relative risk conversion and resources, that are things that drive gaps in social class in relation to who gets into university, who graduates from university, who doesn't. And what I'm going to argue is that the very same conditions that give rise to working class benefits in self-concept to task value are the very same conditions which give rise to heavy signalling behaviour which leads to the other structural issues and bigger social class gaps. So what do I mean by that? Signalling essentially says in, in a Germanic context it's quite clear you either go to a university track school or a vocational track school. The signal there is clear. If you're in the university track that's signalling to everybody to say it's expected this person will go to university. In a vocational track, the signal is very clear. You're expected to go into a non-university track. But it's not just Germanic countries that do this, not just tracking country. The same thing emerges implicitly within the US, Australia, the UK. There are lots of implicit signalling behaviours that occur purely as a result of enrolling in certain types of schools. Enrolling in a private school sends a signal to everybody involved that certain things are expected of you when you decide to make the transition from school. So, my argument then in a, in a nutshell is to say that the exact same conditions which I'm saying will give rise to working class kids having high, high self-concept, controlling for achievement, are the very same conditions which should give rise to the largest social class differences in university entry and graduation. So let's start having a look at the results. Um, here is a graph of three countries. Um, on the y-axis is percentile rank within the school. 
on the x-axis is percentile rank within the country. There's three countries here. Wonder which country do you think is on the left? Any ideas? Where there's a tight match between rank within school and rank within country? Yeah. 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 The one on the far right, where there's not much relationship between rank within school and rank within country. Any ideas of what country? Germany. Close. This was a prettier graph than the German one, so I chose Hungary. But the German one looks more or less the same, but it's not quite as pretty. <laughs> the middle one is Australia. And what are the numbers on the side? So the top one there says that in Finland, working class kids have a percentile rank of 2.6 percentiles higher in their school than they do in the country. Salary class, which is managers and professionals, their rank within, on average, their rank within the school is the same as their rank within the country. Let's move over to Hungary here. In Hungary, working class kids are enrolled in schools in which their average percentile rank is 16.6 .6 percentiles higher than their, their percentile rank within the country. And this is the kicker. In professional classes, they are 9% so points lower in their school than they are in the, in the country. So these kids end up thinking that they're much dumber than they actually are. Whereas maybe the opposite is not so much true. And this is where I start to be talking about what I call this whole concept is the idea of information distortion. Kids in Hungary are getting a distorted idea of their relative position within the country. And why do I call that an absolute position? because my view is that school is development of human capital for expenditure in a particular labour market. So the country is the labour market for which most people are relative, so that's why it's called absolute. Whereas in Finland, the Finnish kids are getting a pretty decent position, uh, a decent idea of their position within the wider labour market um, by knowing where they are within the school. So I'm arguing that this should translate to High self-concept differences favouring these guys, but also bigger attainment gaps in terms of university entry and graduation. So let's have a look. This here is um, open countries, uh, Finland, Sweden, Norway, uh, Jesse, what's the other one? Iceland. Uh, stratified countries, US, Australia, UK, there's something else, Canada. And track countries are Germany, Hungary, Austria, and uh, Slovak Republic. Yeah. Oh, and Czech Republic. Yeah. Um, and so what I want you to point your attention to is what's happening is sort of in line with my theory. So if we look over here, the difference between working class kids and professional class kids, working class kids have a Collins D of almost 0.2 higher on uh, intrinsic value, um, 0.15 at, uh, relative, a bit above 0.1 on self-concept and utility value. So working class kids, conditioned on achievement, have much, well, relatively higher self-concept and values in track countries. Similar thought, sort of thing is happening in stratified countries. The thing that goes against my theory is that in Finland and Sweden, which I argue should have no social class differences at all, occasionally, particularly in relation to utility value, uh, actually have significantly lower. Don't know why. We can talk about that later. Uh, but majoritively, these di the differences in the open um, systems are not significant. In the others, they're always significant. And always in favour of working class kids over professional kids or intermediate. So, um, semi-professional over um, professional class kids. Does everyone follow that so far? Mm -hmm. Good. However, I said the same conditions that will give rise to benefits in self-concept will lead to larger attainment gap differences. Don't have it from multiple countries. All I've got is aspirations. But I'll come back to this in a second. And you can see that in tracked countries, the differences in a likelihood of aspiring to a university degree are massive. Working class kids are much less likely to aspire to go to university 
than their uh, professional peers. Uh, even when they're conditioned on achievement, and, it, and what's really interesting, and this is a little bit of a hint, is that when they're conditioned on both achievement and self-concept, the gaps get a little bit bigger. So, there is a little bit of an advantage uh, in terms of the benefit of self-concept, but it seems to be swamped by other things. Essentially, the difference in aspirations are so large that the benefits of the little extra boost that working class kids get in self-concept and task value are so small they get swamped by other things. Um, I'm proviso here, what I'm not saying, I'm not saying that self-concept and task value aren't critical in predictors of university entry. It's not the case. What I'm saying is that social class differences are much smaller than what us as educational psychologists sometimes like to think and that those differences are so small that they don't really lead to the benefits or the detriments we might think. Um, and I want to try and pull that out a little bit by using a few counterfactuals. So, there's a longitudinal study that follows um, the data I have been using, which is PISA, and it follows them in Australia from age... Is, is that PISA 2003 or... 2003. Yep. Right, eh? because uh, aspirations were not a part of anything else. That's it. correct. That's why 2003 was used, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know why they did that. They did include it for some countries in 2009, but only some, I don't know. Um, and, uh, but Jesse's got some interesting stuff that shows some of the same things occurring in um, 2012, so maybe you can ask him about it later. Counterfactuals with the longitudinal studies. So this is a longitudinal study following the Australian sample of the PISA from age 15 to 25. And what I want to ask is a counterfactual question. And the counterfactual question is this. Let's suppose that all other conditions stay the same, but this, the working class advantage um, in self-concept and task values that we showed beforehand, let's pretend it doesn't exist. So in other words, let's pretend that there is no difference conditioned on achievement in self-concept by task value. How much of a decline in the gap in um, university entry and graduation would we expect under that counterfactual? So let's have a look. Model one is the model as is. So conditioned on achievement, professional class people um, are 0.247%, so 24.7% more likely to go to university than working class kids, and they're also 23.3% more likely to graduate from university than uh, working class kids. Okay? In model two, what we do is we um, take the parameters from the model and pretend that social class differences don't exist, so we remove those out. And these are the, the uh, results. What I want you to point your attention to is this third column here which is the difference between these two models. And what I'm claiming essentially here is that the little bit of benefit that working class kids get in terms of self-concept and um, in terms of task value in the way in which we define our educational system um, really doesn't do much. The, attain the attainment gaps are still massive. And it's also probably a little silly to think that we could get rid of those uh, social class gaps and self-concept and task values and leave the whole system alone. Likely what's going to be the case is if we remove differences in self-concept and task value by um, social class, the educational system will become more like Finland. And in Finland there's much smaller gaps between social classes in achievement. And if we do that, what we see essentially is that rather than getting a bit of a benefit we actually get um, a bit of a decline. So, all in all, I suppose what I'm saying is that when it comes to social class, even though self-concept and task value are, are really important predictors, they may not particularly be useful in closing gaps between um, working class and professional class people. Again, not saying that those things aren't important. I've got a few papers which strongly suggest that they are important. 
they're just not as important in explaining the gap between the social classes. And this leads me to my first slide with text, sort of, which is a bunch of questions I don't know the answers to. And so I suppose what my question is, is that often we talk about the need for doing self-concept interventions to close various gaps uh, with disadvantaged groups. It makes me wonder, uh, would those things, are they really a good tool for social justice uh, sorts of programs? The second question I have is, is it possible that what I've got wrong here is the group that I'm using? So Goldthorpe will argue that the reason that social um, class uh, gaps and self-concept and achievement are not big at all in his model, they don't exist, is because social classes have become so diffuse that they have no normative power. They just don't have the social gravity to change people's perception on things. So maybe other sorts of groupings, which have uh, much smaller and tighter might have a bigger ability to sway people's self-concepts and aspirations in a different way. So maybe we need to think about the sorts of groups that we talk about. So uh, David Brunsky, for example, says, forget about working class versus professional class. What we need to look at is much distincter units. So kids of lawyers versus kids of doctors. And, and by those smaller groupings, maybe we'll find something else. Maybe these sorts of results I've shown don't turn up when we look at uh, other social groupings of um, disadvantage. Um, the other thing, and Herb and I talked about this, is, is maybe, I mean, essentially these results emerge from a, a big fish little pond, which is contrast. But maybe there are other sorts of constructs which are assimilative, in which you do assimilate towards your major social group. And so I suppose the question is, is how are we going to find out which non-cognitive constructs operate under the rules of contrast and which operate under the rules of assimilation? Um, I suspect that things like school belonging and those sorts of things really do have an assimilative nature and social class kind of sorts of traditional <laughs> stereotype views might emerge in some of those traits, don't know. Um, also, it really starts to make us think about how we structure our educational system. So, we do have different models around the world, from the Finnish type of um, almost random assignment, the Germanic um, tracking type idea, the, uh, what's happening increasingly in the US and Australia is essentially geographic segregation. Um, and so, we have these kind of ideas and, and they're, they're rooted in, in different political orientations. Um, tracking and stratification tend to be associated with a real passion, at least in Australia and the US, with freedom of choice. Parents should be able to choose between different varieties of educational options, whereas um, other views from Finland and those sorts of countries really emphasise the importance of equality in outcomes. How do we balance those competing demands and what, what does that tell us about how we should structure our educational systems? Um, I think the thing that worries me a little bit is the last point, and that is that there are system level issues that have nothing to do with education that can still give rise to these. And the obvious one is geographic segregation. Uh, we see it clearly in the US, and it's happening in Australia, in which we have gated communities of um, professional doctors, lawyers, whatever, uh, and uh, suburbs which are increasingly distant terms of kilometres from each other, such that we're, we're stratifying society by geography rather than choices by education. What do we do about, you know, what meaningfully at the policy level, uh, what kind of implications does that have for education, or, or maybe it doesn't have implications for education, maybe it's just a, a risk that we need to try and mitigate within our educational system. So these are the sorts of questions that I'm hoping might stimulate some discussion. and. Um, because I don't really know the answer to any of them. Questions, thoughts, questions? Was there any research on commuting? Because I can imagine people living in poorer suburbs taking a train to 
eastern suburbs to go to better schools. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, uh, in other work that I've kind of looked at in terms of the role of geography on, on university entry, uh, there does seem to be uh, people don't like to leave their suburb, people like to remain. And, and so, in other words, the threshold of benefit in which people are willing to travel is quite high. So, people would have to see a large benefit in order to do those sorts of communities. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what those benefits would be perceived as. Yeah, in my way. Uh, very interesting talk, thanks. Very uh, I have quite a few questions, but I'll just mention a couple. Uh, do you have any information about communist countries, for example? Uh, because yeah. there are supposed to be no differences uh, in anything uh, yeah. there and therefore some of these effects should not appear. That would be nice. It would be nice if you had, uh, you know, if you can do the same thing with Shanghai, for example, that uh, has been very, very, high, or some of the other uh, Chinese uh, uh, parts of the, of the system. You have it now, but not in 2003. That is one thing. Um, uh, yeah, I, I agree that would be interesting. Because you know, intentionally they are trying to yeah. erase the, the difference. But you have Hungary, which is a Czech Republic, which are former uh, communist countries, but probably not as strong as uh, some of the others. That's just, one just on that before you go, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned Hungary and, and, and the other one that's interesting is Sweden because traditionally in your mind you've got that the, the educational system should follow particular things, so Sweden should be really Nordic, um, Czech and Hungary should be, you know, from their fo former communist roots should be, but actually um, uh, educational stratification is massive in Sweden and it's massive in Hungary then. Yeah, you can show that. Yeah. that. That is interesting. And it's probably a part of the German influence. Yeah. Uh, in, in Hungary, German influence was probably stronger that it was not uh, eliminated yes. through the, uh, <laughs> that one. <laughs> <laughs> You're the place I want to promote it. Yeah, it looks like, it looks like NATO. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, I think I think one, uh, that it would be nice if we can order all the countries in 2003 in terms of the development, uh, in terms of the certification issues. What you have done is picked up parts yeah. that are pronounced, and in the experimental psychology, for example, they do it deliberately sometimes to show the effects uh, yeah. by by not taking the circle but taking the extremes. And I think that is one of the problems, and I don't know whether you can do it or not. The other issue I think is more, more interesting to me, uh, um, and it has to do with your focus on self-concept as the only measure of self-belief. Aspiration is a part, but uh, as, as you know, uh, when you say self-belief, you should also, at, at least the way I think about it, uh, include self-efficacy. And you should also include uh, uh, anxiety. Now, yep. okay. Uh, now they don't show the differences uh, across the country, uh, uh, countries of the same kind as uh, as uh, self concept does. And my question is: uh, Are they likely to influence some of these things that you're talking about or not? I can't uh, see self efficacy doing so. And, and the reason is is self efficacy as Bandura defined, it is so concretely assigned to a particular task that I, I don't know that it has the same sort of rank order dependency that self-concept and I assume anxiety does. So I, I think that these sorts of effects would emerge only in relation to variables which are uh, highly influenced by rank order dependency anywhere where the big fish will find the effect works and, and Herbie will probably be able to correct me but my thinking is that with self-efficacy defined in that manner that the big fish shouldn't really emerge. Well the problem with self-efficacy is that there's no consistency in the way that it's defined. Yeah, that's and, right. uh, So if you hold up a math problem 
and say, what's the likelihood that you're going to be able to do that? Yeah, and then, that's kind of what I'm then, yeah. then the self-concept, or then the big fish little pond effect is minimized. Yeah. And if you uh, measure self-efficacy in terms of how likely are you to be able to do something that isn't necessarily concrete, then it, it, the less concrete it is, the more it becomes. And then uh, some, uh, some scales that are called self-efficacy really act the same way as self-concept, and there's no difference. And so there's a whole range. And I, I suppose that's what I'd be getting at. So but anxiety, uh, there's huge big fish little pond effect for yeah. anxiety. It's well, that's like, what I'm yeah, suggesting. Yeah, as big as, uh, as self-concept. I just never bothered to. It. Um, I mean, in terms of the PISA definition of it, I tend not to include it just because it's so highly correlated with self-concept. It's 0.85. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's yeah. You know, there yeah. are different prospects and so on. So uh, the high correlation you have between the uh, self-determination concepts, from what I know, um, yeah, they are still talking about mm -hmm. different things. But that, that is one thing. What, what, uh, if that distinction between closeness that Herb has just brought in, uh, closeness to the task and the uh, um, uh, uh, difference, then... Uh, no, 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 no. The issue isn't closeness to the task. It's how well defined the standard is in the items. So that uh, if you lay out the standard that they're supposed to be achieving in the item, then they don't have to have any kind of frame of reference. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. That is the difference between uh, self-esteem, uh, self-efficacy uh, as species measuring it and uh, self-efficacy as some people are. But that is an interesting thing because uh, if that is so, uh, then um, uh, from what I know, uh, some measures of personality, for example, that are even more removed than that self-concept, uh, also have high correlation. And I wonder, like for example, openness to experience, uh, they say uh, conscientiousness. Uh, has the, anybody looked at that? Uh, they, this, it might be related to This is Heckman's big thing. So yeah, it's Heckman's, right. Heckman, uh, James Heckman. Yeah, no, I've read it. Yeah, so conscientiousness is his big bugbear at the moment. So and this he's is wrong on that one. He, he's wrong on that one yeah. because openness to experience is much stronger. And I can't remember, he has another one as well. I can't remember what the other one that is. Conscientiousness is, he's pushing that because of Parapata in, in at Griffith. But I, uh, a point 0.19 correlation between conscientiousness and uh, achievement is not something to talk much about. Well, but, yeah, I think he's focused more on, I think he's looking for constructs which are orthogonal to academic ability but are impactful of. Uh, attainment educationally and occupationally and in that context I think it's consciousness and growth mindset I haven't looked at either of them so I don't know but yeah, they're uh, it's pushing you're right and you're, you're saying it probably uh, you're describing it uh, right. but I just wonder why some of these other concepts apart from uh, self concept that might have the uh, properties that you are yep. describing to so, because are eliminated from the discussion. But uh, I agree. that is all right. I, yeah. I, I, it is very important to sort out these issues. Yeah. And it's other stuff like um, belonging and whatever. I mean, what, what's fascinating for me is the one that has the strongest effect, and I check this also with indigenous, non indigenous. Uh, so, in, indigenous kids have significantly high utility value, and it's the biggest effect. Same with working class kids, once you condition on achievement. And so, I think utility value seems to be the one that's uh, has the biggest one of these effects. I just got a message. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, other, other questions? Virginia? Uh, that was a segue to do other social movements have maybe no, more normative problems. I was wondering about minority groups and maybe other majority groups or, I don't know, um, non Aboriginal Australians versus Aboriginal Australians. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm trying to uh, get, uh, Wayne and I are going to try and write a chapter on this, and I, I really don't want to say anything without um, Wayne saying it, but uh, I, I think, I think in educational psychology we sometimes make too much of cultural differences for the wrong constructs, and not enough of cultural differences for the right constructs. And so I think a lot of times we push self-concept, self-concept, or task value in, in relation to closing gaps in relation to Indigenous issues. We've, we've said that here a lot. But if you condition on achievement, there is no difference. 
in fact, there's a slight benefit. So I think a lot of emphasis on social class there may not be the right thing. But, and this is, is Gwaine's area of research, and definitely please. Do you know any states in the US with black and white? It's the same. I mean, I mean this, this kind of thing more or less is, is me hijacking Herb's 87 paper and renaming it so that I get the credit. Um, <laughs> That's a good strategy. Yeah. It, it's sufficiently far in the past that maybe I can get away with it. <laughs> maybe now. No. It's been overly modest. But, the, uh, the, but it's, it's amazing how much of this was in the 87 paper. That's a long time ago. But the same sort of things in there. Uh, and, and this, this emerges with all sorts of things. And, and the, the cultural difference people, so George Akulov and a few others, they make some weird claims about this sort of thing. So but they will make a claim that the reason that um, the black-white differences with, with black kids having higher self-concepts or whatever is because they're different constructs in, in, in black and white kids. I, I don't know what evidence they have for that at all, um, other than it's the only explanation which fits within their assimilation models. Yeah, I'm familiar with the self-esteem literature and the stigma literature, but there's actually no difference in self-esteem levels. Yeah. Um, stigmatized from some black and white and black and The 87 paper was an interesting one because it was uh, still at a time when there were uh, highly segregated schools in the US, and so uh, we were able to show that uh, that the uh, apparently higher uh, self-concepts of uh, black students in black schools uh, could be explained by more or less the kind of thing that Phil's talking about. So that uh, relative to their school, uh, uh, they might be quite bright uh, and their self-concept was quite consistent with uh, their relative rank in the school. Information distortion theory, Parker Uh-huh. I am not sure if this is related at all, but I mean, could you relate the whole discussion of like uh, inclusion, so students with learning disabilities? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. There is there is stuff you know the big fish uh, stuff has been done with you know distinction between main school and and, and uh, segregated school. And I, I think that the difference a little bit there is that I think the role of education that I'm focusing on here, which is the the development of human capital to spend on entry to university or whatever, is is probably less of a ultimate outcome. Um, but I haven't thought through it very much at all. But I, I know that um, mainstreaming has a negative effect on self-concept and, and segregated schooling has a positive effect. Um, but in, in the implications of it, what, what implications that has for aspirations, no clue. A couple of things. Uh, it would be interesting. Most, a lot of times minority groups are seen as disadvantaged, but of course there's some minority groups that are uh, our advantage. It might be interesting to look at some of the assimilation possibilities with advantage uh, uh, minority groups. I guess the other thing that we've talked about a lot that you can't really do with the PISA is uh, distinguish between uh, class average achievement and school average achievement. And so one of the real complications here is, is that you can have uh, schools that aren't particularly tracked, but huge tracking within the schools. And some of the stuff that we're looking at now uh, suggests that the within school tracking trumps the between school tracking. I don't know whether it would necessarily do that in relation to here, but I suspect it would. I suspect it would, yeah. yeah. I mean, there is that, that theory, um, Lucas, uh, it's called um, effectively maintained inequality. And it's the idea that the parents will always seek out a qualitative, what they view as a qualitative advantage for their child. And so there is a constant pressure, even within Finland and, and whatever, to have some form of segregation or, or tracking in, in some way. I mean, that can be choices to move to different times, so there are people moving to Helsinki rather than Vascular or whatever. Mm. Um, but I, I think there's a constant pressure, which means um, 
I would imagine these sorts of effects would be bigger. And I think I, I state that in the, the um, well, at least in the paper I did, um, uh, that the effects should be bigger if we could get a handle on within school tracking. I guess one of the adages that I proposed a whole long time ago that's pretty accurate, I think, is that almost anything that we do that's good in educational settings, uh, it it makes the gap bigger because anything that we do will probably be taken advantage of more by uh, high SES uh, groups and low SES groups so that even when we're doing something that we can show is good, we're probably increasing the gap rather than decreasing it. So that kind of works against a lot of what you're trying to do. Well, I think it's interesting because um, there is a, both both left and right wing views of education in the US, at least in the last 10 years, have been towards some form of smaller schooling with a strong, specific identity. And, and in, that, in that case, I think that, uh, I mean, obviously one group wants to get to get theater and the other group wants to try and use these things. And I think in, in that case, both strategies will lead to bigger gaps. I think uh, what, we're, what I'm trying what I'm suggesting here is that if the information that you get is an accurate reflection of your possession of human capital within a particular labour market, then that's going to be a beneficial thing for choosing in it, choosing what sorts of things to take post school. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's at a higher level. But it's not going to help much in changing the gap. Well, I mean, you look at countries that have um, that system and the gaps are uh, much smaller, okay. considerably so. Yeah. Okay. Um, they're half the size. And, and, you know, the other paper we just submitted shows that the moment that stratification gets wider, and we used all countries in this one, the reason I didn't use all countries is because I wanted to know the educational system. And so these schools are ones that I have an intimate knowledge of. But you know, school systems like Turkey or Mexico, I know nothing about. But in that case, we used all all countries and all piece yeah, waves. Yeah, you have to show that they uh, are not different, or the same. Yeah, and, and, and anyway, when we used all countries at, at, and looking at piece of waves, increases in stratification were associated with increases in in uh, social class gaps. You know, talking about all these. Eh? Uh, I seem to remember about two years ago there are some statistics about the increase of the intake of the university students eh, over the past 20 years or so. And it, it, it was huge from what I remember, from about 20% to about 40%. So when you talk about the gap, it is a relative thing. A smaller number of people down there are still behind. Eh? Yep. And uh, 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 the smaller that group becomes, the less important. Yeah. John Goldthorpe is clapping from the UK. I mean, that's exactly his distinction. And this is why uh, John Goldthorpe has a big problem with economics, as he says that all they focus on is the absolute gap. And so they look at the educational expansion and they say, isn't that wonderful? And he says, that's not the important thing, it's the relative gap. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's been an expansion in higher education, but associated with that, is a higher bar to get into certain positions. So occupations that used to require less than a high school diploma now in some cases require a master's degree. And so what happens is that even though the absolute gap changes, the relative gap, if you look from the past century and a half, hasn't changed at all, it's just flat. Uh, so that's the odd, odds ratio of going into a salary versus whatever versus the correlation between um, parents' position, uh, parents' education and child's education. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's that's what you're hitting on is exactly this point. The, the important thing is to focus on the relative, not the absolute. Yeah. Just curious, like in the schools, when the kids are running the sign, in the school are the classes ranked? Uh, um, almost inevitably, uh, either implicitly or explicitly, they have, but they would be. Uh, uh, that's what I was trying, uh, trying to get at in terms of it. There's such a pressure from parents to have some form of, of screening, whether it's implicit or explicit, they just naturally emerge. I mean, there has to be such a strong 
policy position that's constantly pushing against that for that to occur. I just don't think it's ever the case. I think there is a, a constant push the stream, and, and so this thing happens all the time. And it actually happens not just um, uh, like by pressure from parents, but also happens from pressure teachers. So um, Martin Covington uh, talks about a study of um, kindergarten and that um, within, literally within class, stratification happens in the first day of kindergarten when kids are assigned to different desks. So uh, these kids are low achievement kids, these kids are high achievement kids, how do they make the decision on the first day of kindergarten? Well, it's, it's which ones kind of look like, you know, they're dressed well, they're clean, they're whatever. They're, they're the, the high achievement kids. And so that sort of stratification happens from day one in kindergarten. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I'm still thinking. Because <laughs> well, I'm thinking about the 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 category the, the categories. Like, yep. what is open? Is it really open? What is stratified? Is it really stratified? I'm thinking about places like Shanghai. Yep. It's about Chinese uh, the the uh, cities along the coastline. Yep. If you walk two blocks away from a rich school, yep. you'll find children sitting on the dust floor, no chairs, no desk, no blackboard. And well, you call it open. Yes, they can choose to go there, but they have to ride a bicycle an hour to go to a school, which is pretty good. And actually, I have experience you know, working with some of these schools. Some of the kids, during lunchtime, they have to ride back home to have lunch. Then another hour back to the school. Where is that? It's fantastic. Like 12 classes. Yeah. 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 12 yeah. classes, right? About a thousand kids. Just in year seven. A big school. A very big school. Uh, you compare the 12 classes, the average achievement is the same. Yep. So absolutely open, right? Random. Yep. Randomly assigned to classes. But if you look at that school compared to another school two blocks away, as I said, uh, the difference is so big. Yeah, even if you have an open, you define it as open, well, well it's, uh, some, some of them don't even have a choice. In this case, it's defined uh, purely on two metrics. Uh, and one is, and so it's all at the school level, not at the class level, because I don't have any information on class within PISA. And I define the countries based on two metrics. One is uh, 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 Bolidor's uh, index of tracking, so age of first selection, number of tracks, um, something else. Um, and then the other in index is just the in, uh, the intra cluster correlation. So in, in Finland, the intra class correlation is 0 0.04, and in uh, Netherlands, it's 0 0.65. I want to say. So uh, that's that's the definition. Of that. so, when you say intra cluster between the schools, between the schools, yeah, no information on classes. So uh, though in, in the Netherlands, I think we looked at the. There's also a big interclass correlation at the class level as well. Um, so if you, if you, I've got the metric somewhere. If you have a look at open stratified and tracking, there are qualitatively distinctions in those two metrics for each of those. So the open countries have both low tracking and low ICCs. The average ICC is about 0.09. Uh, the tracking index is negative one. Um, in stratified countries, the tracking index is also negative one, but the average ICC I think is about point. 2.3 and in track countries the index isn't negative one it's positive one and um, I think the ICC average ICC is about 3.35.4 3, so you know there, there are clear qualitative dis distinctions on those two um, which is how I assign the countries to but, but again I only chose countries that I know sufficiently enough about their educational structure to make some sensible um, you know, I understand enough about that. Okay. And that's one day, so.
Thanks, Phil.